Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I want to thank Richard for mailing in a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can also support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net, or you can use the Zelle app and send your donation in to uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. And I want to go ahead and thank our latest Patreon supporter who supported the show at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Shannon came aboard at the uh, rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. Well, now we're going to get into Rocky Jordan. And at this point, we are to the series that stars George Raft in the title role. Now, I've had a few questions about the decision to choose uh, Raft. And I think the reason that they went with Raft in the series is that there's a thought process that I think is pretty traceable. Rocky Jordan went off the air in uh, September of 1950. It's a great concept, but uh, radio is earning less and less money. Television taking a greater share of revenue. So how do you increase your chances of landing a sponsor and being able to continue to do Rocky Jordan. I think someone at CBS thinks, you know, we could do this if we got a Hollywood name. And we're able to get George Raft uh, for not that much money. Raft really uh, did have a star status in Hollywood. He was one of those guys who was known for playing uh, tough guys, did a ton of gangster uh, films. Uh, most famously, Scarface. He also became uh, famous for uh, declining roles in films that turned out to be really good. Uh, for example, he turned down the uh, lead part in Double Indemnity, which went to Fred McMurray. And uh, Humphrey Bogart's career was to an extent built on roles that uh, George Raft declined. Two biggest examples being High Sierra and the Maltese Falcon. It is often stated that he turned down the role of Rick in Casablanca, but from what I've read, that's more rumor and probably something that is misinterpreted from all the roles that uh, Bogart got when he dec when uh, Raft declined. There were about six of those, but probably not Casablanca. If that were true, though, that would have made his casting as Rocky Jordan uh, make even more sense. Here, the guy who, uh, who turned down Casablanca play a sort of Rick-like character. But CBS's calculations were a bit off because Raft was actually, in 1951, in a declining period in his career, much like Frank Sinatra was when he took on the role of Rocky Fortune. Only Raft would have a much longer road back. George Raft's run as Rocky Jordan would be on a summer replacement basis at first, and certainly if they could find a sponsor, then that could be extended. But before they did the actual summer series, uh, they did an audition recording, uh, and this one, uh, an audition date of March the 28th of 1951, and the title is The Man from Damascus. Now, starring George Raft, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. If you're ever out this way, stop in. I'll have Chris, my bartender, mix you one. You won't forget. <laughs> The Café Tambourine in Cairo. 
Crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, chiefs, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Man from Damascus. Hi, I'm Chris. I've been Rocky Jordan's bartender and best pal for years. He told me you might stop in. Sit down. Hey, Chris. Oh, excuse me a minute. Oh, yeah, Rock? Watch those two in the corner. They look like a couple of pickpockets I knew in Istanbul. I'll keep an eye on them, Rocky. And if they start moving around, throw them out. Yeah. And, uh, Chris. Yeah? Take it easy on the conversation tonight, huh? Me? Oh, Rock, don't I always? <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, I'll be in the office, Chris. <laughs> okay, Rocky. He's a great guy. He tells me a lot of things. Oh, not everything, but a lot. He's hard as nails if he's being pushed, but with a soft spot in his heart. Well, for instance, you ever been in Damascus? Rocky met a man from Damascus once, was as twisted as they come. I remember it was a hot Wednesday evening just after the Moisin had called the natives to prayer. I was here at the bar serving up some arak to a sailor from Port Said. Rocky was up front watching it get dark out in the street. That's when the girl came in. Oh, her hair was black and her eyes were wide and gray, green and plenty worthwhile. She had what it takes. And on Rocky, it took. He suddenly lost all interest in the street outside as she walked up to him. Pardon. You are Mr. Jordan. Rocky Jordan. Yeah, lady, that's right. I am Sandra Marr. I am new to Cairo. I arrived only today from Damascus in uh, Syria. Glad to know you, Miss Moore. Sightseeing? You may call me Sandra. And no, I'm not sightseeing. I came to your cafe expressly to see you. Oh, just to see me. I would like to talk to you. Can you give me a little of your time? Time? <laughs> That's the one thing I have plenty of, Sandra. Uh, shall we go back to my table? Thank you. You are very kind, Rocky. I will take but a few moments. Take as many as you like. Here we are. Mm, thank you. Oh, uh, can I get you something, Rocky? Would you like a drink, Sandra? No, thank you. Oh, nothing, Chris. Well, uh, you said you wanted to talk. Mm. Have you a light for my cigarette? Oh, sure, sure. Here you are, Sandra. Oh. <sighs> thank you, Rocky. Now, uh... What's on your mind? I was told that of all people in Cairo, you were the one who could help me. You know Cairo, all of it. You have ways of finding things out. Mm, maybe. Go on. I am looking for someone. Mm, someone here in the tambourine? No, Rocky. But I must find this someone quickly, tonight. Oh, why come to me? I run a cafe, not a traveler's aid bureau. Oh, please do not make jokes with me. I'm not. Promise then that you will help me. I can be most grateful. Please, Rocky, promise for me. Look, Sandra, I don't know what your game is, but I like all the cards on the table. All my cards are on the table. No, they're not. Who is this someone? What's your angle? I, I cannot say. You can't or won't. Which? Oh, that's too bad. It could have been real nice meeting you, Sandra. But, Rocky, I must find him. He told me he was coming to Cairo on business, but I know that is not true. He is in trouble, some terrible sort of trouble. Why don't you go to the police? The police? Oh, no. They must know nothing of this. Oh, great. You want me to find a guy who's in trouble? The kind of trouble you can't go to the police with. Uh -huh. No, thanks. Please, Rocky, I will pay for your help. I told you before. I want all the cards on the table. I like you, Sandra. And I'd like to help you. Now, uh, do you want to tell me what this is all about? Rocky, I cannot. You must trust me. Sorry, Sandra. I've been burned before. No information, no deal. She did. 
didn't say another word, just got up and started for the door. Rocky watched her all the way out, then he lit a smoke and headed for his office. I was cracking out another bottle of Arak for the thirsty sailor when we heard it. By the time I got clear of the bar, Rocky was already out the front door. Street was full of sounds and smells and people, but none of them was the girl with the gray-green eyes. Chris, I'm sure that was the girl who was just in here. Maybe she really did need help. Yeah, but Rocky, where is she? Oh, she can't be very far. I'm going to have a look. You better get back to the till. He was gone a good half hour looking for him. But when he finally got back, he was alone. Hey, Rocky. What is it, Chris? Did you find her? Mm, not a sign. I wonder what happened. I don't know. But I got a feeling that the night's not over yet. Oh, you're so right. There's, uh... It's a guy here to see you, Rock. He's in your office. He's what? Yeah, well, Rock, it was like Chris, this. Chris, the, the Chris, guy... small oh, Forty sailor. days on the water and no drink but water. Come yeah, I'll be me. right with you, sailor. You want me to go in with you, Rock? No, I'll handle it, Chris. You take care of sailor boy there. Yeah, okay. All right, sailor. I'll rock. Come on. Hello, Jordan. Make yourself at home. That's what I'm doing. Pretty good liquor in your private stock. It's too rich for your taste, buddy. Put it down. Yeah, the perfect host, huh? Put it down. Sure, sure. Funny, figured you're different. Everybody in town says you're a right guy. Mm, maybe you've been talking to the wrong people. Well, what do you want? You. I've got 1,000 pounds here for you, Jordan. There. Go ahead, count it. What's that for? Partial payment for services about to be rendered. No, thanks. I'm not for sale. That thousand pounds is just a start, pal. There's more where that came from. Mm, there always is. Yeah. Come on, Zorton, you got an appointment. I can't make it. Now, that's a mistake, pal. You and me, we are working for the same fella. We are, huh? Well, bring him around sometime. He don't figure that way. You see, he's got... Look, to... take that money and get out of here. Get away from that door, Jordan, or I pin you to the wall. Seven-inch blade, pal. Damascus steel. Take it easy, Heavy. Sure. And it's double-edged, Jordan. You don't want to argue with this. You're right. I don't. Hey, come on, then. Let's go. Out the back way. The big monkey with a knife marched Rocky out the back door of the tambourine into a car parked in the alley, and they ended up at a sagging heap called the House of Sand that passed for a hotel. They climbed the stairs, and with the big guy's knife at his spine, Rocky was stopped in front of the door to room 12. Go on, knock. Who is this? Jordan. He's come for the rest of the dough. You're taking a lot for granted, Buster. You may let him come in now. Go ahead, Jordan. Meet your new boss. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Nice of you to come. You go leave us alone, please. Sure. You look shocked, Mr. Jordan. Sit down. I'll take it standing. Puzzled, perhaps, at what you see? My head completely wrapped in bandages? Who are you? You may call me the man from Damascus. That tells me a lot. Why the disguise? You mean my bandages? It is quite simple. I no longer have a face. Ever hear of plastic surgery? That will take a great deal of time and money. There is something I must do first. How about getting to the point? Very well. There is a man in Cairo I want. You are going to find him and bring him to me. <laughs> oh, what do you know? I turned down that same offer earlier tonight. And it was much more attractive then. Don't press your good fortune, Jordan. Now listen to me. The man you will bring to me is Alex Zarko. Alex Zarko? Why, the police have had it dragging it out for him for over two weeks. And I want to get to him before they do. Jordan, you know where a man like Zarko would hide and how to get to him. Sorry, you've got the wrong guy. Jordan, listen to me. I cannot go looking for him like this. I will double that thousand pounds. Jordan, be reasonable. I'm trying to. Zarko is wanted for attempted assassination and assorted murders. The Egyptian police have got him bottled up here in Cairo. Why, they've got the riverfront, every road, train, and flight covered. It's only a matter of time. Exactly. And I want him first. What have you got against Zarko? It was he. 
Alex Zarko, who took my face from me. Oh. Apparently you cannot realize what it is to know that you can never walk the streets again without a covering over the horror that was once a face. Well, Jordan? No deal. You've got a private beef with Zarko. Keep it that way. Now, do I get out of here or not? This time you do, because I still need your help. Don't count on it. Jordan, wait. Now that you have seen me and know my purpose, you can be as much of a menace to me as a help. Consider that carefully, Jordan. If I do not hear from you again within an hour, I shall act accordingly. When Rocky come back to the tambourine, he didn't say a word. Just drew himself a beer, went over to a table in the back, and sat down facing the door. He was there for over an hour, like he was waiting for something to happen. And it finally did, but not what he was expecting. It was the girl with the gray-green eyes again. She walked right back to Rocky's table. But before she could reach him, Rocky was on his feet. Sandra. Rocky, please. It is not easy for me to inflict myself on you for the second time. But I have to. I'm sorry. Never mind the apology, Sandra. What happened? When you sent me away before, there was a man out there in the street. A big man who carries a knife. I had seen him before, only a few days ago in Damascus. He started after me, but I got away and hid. From both of us? Oh, I went to look for you myself. I'm glad you did. But when I left my hiding place, I saw you drive away from here with that same man. It is my belief he took you to the person I am seeking. The one who calls himself the man from Damascus, huh? Yes. Will you tell me now where the man from Damascus is? The answer still no. He's looking for trouble and you don't belong in it. But I do. I must help him. Help him? Maybe you don't know he's gunning for a guy named Alex Zarko. Oh, no, that cannot be true. Paul is not that kind of person. Paul... Paul? Paul Ma, maybe? Yes. Oh. I see. Paul. You'll find him in a place called the House of Sand. Oh, Rocky, thank you. Someday I hope I can explain. Well, you got what you came here for, Sandra. See you around. Rocky, please, you do not understand. But I, 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 I must go to him. Don't let me keep you, Sandra. Oh, Rocky. Rocky watched the walk out for the second time in one night. And then he started to come up front toward the bar. I looked up just in time. Rocky! At the back door, a guy with his whole head in bandages. He's got a gun! Rocky, look out! <laughs> your hour is up, Jordan! You have made your decision! Now die with it! <laughs> Listening to The Man from Damascus, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, starring George Raft. And now we take you back to Cairo and Rocky Jordan's adventure with The Man from Damascus. When the man from Damascus cut down on my boss, Rocky, and splattered the glassware around with his 38 slugs, he made a lot of changes in the tambourine. All the cash customers disappeared in a hurry. Rocky was bleeding from a nick in his left shoulder. And for a topper, who should come walking in but Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police, a gentleman with an awful lot of cop know-how under his red fez. Good evening, Jordan. Is it possible that I can be of some slight service at this time? I doubt it, Sam. The floor show's over. Better get a broom, Chris, and let me know how much stuff was broken. I'm going to collect damages in full. Yeah, okay, Rock. Uh, damages from whom, Jordan? I can't remember. Oh, here. Uh, give me a hand with this handkerchief, will you, Sam? I've got a little scratch here. Oh, yes, of course, certainly. Uh, Jordan, the caller's name, what did you say it was? I didn't say. Jordan, who did this? I said I didn't remember. Oh, by the way, Sam, what brought you here so fast? Don't tell me you were just passing by and heard the shots. No, Georgia, no. 
I was warned this shooting would take place. I wish I could have arrived a little earlier. What's the angle, Sam? Care to name it? I will name it, Jordan. It is Alex Zarko. I am determined that he shall not get out of Cairo. That this time he will not escape the law. Why come to me? Somebody say I was tied in? Precisely. Who? I can't remember, Jordan. Oh. Now about the shooting. Is Zarko connected with it? If you mean, did he pull the trigger? No. I mean what I said. Is Zarko connected with this? Maybe. But at the moment, it's a private matter. Violence is never a private matter. Now, for the last time, what is this shooting all about? Very well, Jordan. I cannot force you to speak at this time. However, I wish to warn you that if anyone else is injured in this private matter of yours, I shall hold you responsible. Don't worry about me, Sam. I'll be good. Just as good as the next guy. But no better. When Captain Sabaya left, Rocky waited just long enough to get a decent dressing on his shoulder, and then he headed back for Room 12 at the House of Sand. But the man of bandages had checked out. Room 12 was as empty as a camel's future. It made the front desk the next stop, and there Rocky found the landlady, a relic older than the Sphinx, but a little noisier, completely engrossed in a U.S. comic book (laughs) called The Phantom Menace. Say, lady. Lady. Hey, sweetheart. Front and center. Oh, oh, Effendi. The Phantom Menace has just captured Brick Braun and is dipping him head first into a barrel of pickle brine 100 times. It is very funny. I'm glad you're having fun. But if you can get a hold of yourself for a minute, it might earn you a pound note. All the laughter has suddenly departed. How can I earn this magnificent sum? By giving me the forwarding address on the party who just vacated room 12. Oh, that would be a short, fat man with a bald spot. A seller of fly swatters. No, that would be a tall man with bandages where he should have a face. A seller of death. Death comes higher than fly swatters. Not always, but I'll go two pounds. Oh. The young lady offered me five pounds. Young lady? A brunette with gray eyes? The same. All right. I'll go five pounds. She resides now in room ten of this establishment. I think she loves the man of the hidden face. I think she waits on the vain hope of his return. Nobody asks you what you think. I'm paying you for what you know. Here's five pounds. Now, when did number twelve check out? Two hours ago. How did he leave? By taxi. I myself called it. Do you know the driver? I do indeed. He is a descendant of the evil dog. I want his name, not his pedigree. Harry Amar. Residence 303 Sharia Shaman. Oh, it is worth his five pounds to but mention his name. Well, play like you're the fan of Madison. He's Brick Braun. <laughs> I shall, and I will be bathed in ecstasy. (laughs) Rocky left the old woman cackling over her comic book and checked out that cab driver, Holly Amar. After a little uh, persuasion, he told Rocky he'd left the man from Damascus off at another termite trap called the Little Nile. The man with the bandages was holed up on the second floor. Rocky listened to the door, but he didn't hear anything inside, so he eased it open. First thing he saw was a guy in a chair across the room. Was the man from Damascus, all right. Second thing he saw was a little Italian-made gun in the guy's hand. Pointed straight at Rocky's chest. What has kept you, Jordan? I didn't know you were waiting. That is close enough. Well, you have come. Living up to your reputation perfectly. I knew that if I had not killed you in your cafe, you would come looking for me. Put down that gun. You're not going to kill me here. For one thing, Captain Sabaya knows you're after me. That does not worry me, Jordan. Maybe not. But for another thing, Sandra's in town. Sandra? That's right. She's in Cairo looking for you. She came to me for help. Right now, she's at the House of Sand waiting for you to come back. Sandra. My sister. Your what? My beautiful sister. The only person I have in the world. So you're her brother. Well, what do you know? And I took you for Mr. and Mrs. Sandra thinks an awful lot of you, Ma. She doesn't think you could kill anybody. Me or Alex Zarko. Regardless of what's happened. Stop it, Jordan. Do not unnerve me. 
You and I are stalemated. You have a score to settle with me, but I am holding the gun. Now, if I drop the gun... You want me to drop the grudge, is that it? Yes. I do not want you dead, Jordan. Because I can still use your help. I still want Alex Zarko. And if you can be trapped... You're crazy. I told you once, I'm not butting into a private feud. But I am, Jordan. (laughs) Sam. You will drop the gun, please. Drop it! You're really getting around tonight, Sam. I know you well enough, Jordan, to realize that you would not allow someone to shoot at you and then forget it. When you would not tell me who had done it, I knew if I followed you long enough, you would lead me to him. You usually do. Look, Sam, this is strictly between Mar and me. I have told you once, Jordan, violence is not a private matter. I will not allow killing if I can help it. And I will not allow either of you to interfere with the police capture of Alex Zarko. You have not found him yet. No, but I will. And you will not. Mr. Mar, you will please remove the bandages from your face. What? I said you will please remove the bandages. Very well. I shall step into the light, gentlemen, so that you may see all that is left of what was once a face. Rocky and Captain Sabaya watched Paul Marr unwind the bandages, uncovering first what should have been his chin, and then the battered purple skin on his cheeks, and the twisted mouth, the mashed nose, and then his eyes. A hard, waxy kind of a stare came from his left eye. An eye that couldn't blink because it had no lid. There. Now. Now you can see why I feel as I do about Alex Zarko. I... I'm most sorry I had to subject you to this, Mr. Marr. But I still cannot allow a personal revenge to interfere with my execution of the law. It is customary in Cairo in affairs of this nature to use the following procedure. There is a train leaving Cairo for Alexandria in one hour. You will please be on the train. From Alexandria, you should have no trouble securing passage back to Syria. Uh, Sam... And uh... you, Jordan, shall remain in my custody until Mr. Marr has left the city. You have then one hour, Mr. Marr. I will meet you at the Cairo station to make certain you have boarded the train. Now you may put the bandages back on your face. Jordan, you will come with me to police headquarters. Come on. Hello? Rocky Jordan, Sandra. Oh, Rocky. I'm calling for police headquarters. Police headquarters? Is it about Paul? Yeah. I know the man from Damascus is your brother. I also know he's leaving Cairo. My hunch is he's going to Damascus. What? How do you know this, Rocky? You have seen him again? Paul will tell you about it if he wants to. He's a pretty mixed up guy, Sandra. He's going to need a lot of help. He says you're the only person he's got. I know. There is no one else. Then I guess it's up to you. Yes, I must go. But Rocky, someday when Paul is himself again... Perhaps I can come back to Cairo? Yeah, perhaps you can. And Rocky, when I do, I... When you do, you know where to find me, Sandra. At the tambourine. Now get going and throw your things in a suitcase and see if you can keep them out of trouble. And Sandra? Yes, Rocky? Good luck. When Rocky and Captain Sabaya got to the train station, there weren't too many people there at that hour of the night. But standing down at the end of the platform under a light that made his bandages look extra white was the guy they were looking for, Paul Mark. As Rocky and the captain walked up to him, his eyes blinked at them through the slits in those wrappings around his head. Well, Mr. Ma, you will be leaving Cairo in a moment. If after a year has passed you wish to return to our city, write me a letter explaining your reasons, and I shall see what can be done to make Cairo available to you once more. Well, that's it. So long, Paul. Take good care of Sandra. Well, that is that. (laughs) A dangerously unhappy man there, Jordan. Not one word of goodbye. Yeah. Well, he's got reasons, Sam. He's... Wait a minute. Sam! What is the matter with you? What? Where are you going? To catch this train. And you better come, too. Come on, let's get it. At the 
run for it, but they both made it. Rocky first, and then Captain Sabaya wheezing in red faced one car later. Rocky started up through the train looking for the guy in the bandages and finally found him. The guy saw him coming and tried to get away, but Rocky nailed him hard. By the time Sabaya got there, the guy in the bandages was just coming too. Jordan, you will please explain the meaning of this. Take a peel off those bandages. That'll explain it. Go on, Sam. You will please remove the bandages, Mr. Marr. Take them off, buddy. Or I'll do it for you. That's right. A little more. Let Sam see who you really are. Jordan, what is this? There you are, Sam. He's not Paul Marr. He's the guy you've been after for weeks. Sam, meet Alex Zarko. You see, it was all a fancy plan of that Zarko guy to get out of Cairo disguised as Paul Marr. And he framed it up with Marr to deliberately create a fuss, you know, like shooting up the tambourine, which he knew was just enough to get him run out of Cairo. It almost worked, too, except Zarko couldn't control his eyes. He blinked once, and once was enough because Rocky remembered that Paul Marr's left eye couldn't blink. Well, when they finally got back to headquarters, Captain Sabaya had some questions. Uh, Jordan, where would you say Paul Marr is now? Probably the House of Sand with his sister. You realize that I must send men to apprehend him. You understand that Marr will have a jail sentence to serve for aiding a criminal. Yeah. Why, why do you suppose he tried to help Zarko escape? Well, put yourself in his place. A face like his. A lot of desperation. It was a business deal. Money any way he could get it for a plastic surgery job. Hmm. You are aware, Jordan, that I must confiscate the money Zarko gave him. I'm aware that you might be able to take the dough. Unless you happen to forget that he's got it. Surely you're not suggesting that I deliberately overlook a financial arrangement that existed between criminals? Yeah, something like that. Jordan, I have always suspected you are a man without scruples. Sure I am. Remember the time I tried to sell that Monte Carlo swindler a half interest in the tourist concession for the tombs of the Memlo? <laughs> uh, remember? Yeah. No. No, I do not believe I do. Oh, huh. My memory is not at all what it used to be. I, I seem to forget things uh, very quickly these days. Thanks, Sam. See you around. <laughs> and that's what I mean. That's what I was telling you about my boss, Rocky Jordan. Hard as nails when he's being pushed, but he's got a soft spot in his heart that, I don't know, kind of pays off. Say, Chris. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Rock, you want me? Yeah. About time to close up. Okay. I'll throw the lock on the back door. Well, folks, we're closing up for the night. I hope that bartender of mine didn't bend your ear too much. When you're in Cairo again, don't forget to stop in here at the Cafe Tambourine. You're always welcome. As long as you don't ask too many questions. Good night. It's CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. George Raff stars as Rocky Jordan. This program is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Aran. Tonight's story by Adrian Janto and Larry Roman was prepared for broadcast by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, there was a couple of uh, changes uh, from the uh, Jack Moyles uh, version. The big difference uh, here that stands out to me 
is that the man from Damascus doesn't blame Rocky for causing something bad to happen. It may have made more sense uh, with uh, Moyles and Rocky Jordan because that series had a lot of references to Jordan's life, to his career as an adventurer. And perhaps with a different actor in the role, they just didn't feel the need to make those sort of references. I really did not like the idea of Chris narrating the series, uh, particularly with Chris uh, telling us what Rocky Jordan is like, how he is as a person and as a character. You didn't need that in the Jack Moyles version, and you shouldn't need that in any decently written series. You shouldn't need a character to tell you, well, this is what this character is like. This is how this character is and acts and behaves. Because you should be shown who this character is and how they act and behave. Nobody had to give Rocky Jordan in the Moyle series a testimonial. And so that was kind of a, a flaw with this episode and... I hope it does not uh, carry on into the summer series. I thought Raft himself was okay. I know a lot of people are going to hate it just because we've listened to more than a year and a half of Jack Moyles in this role. And I don't prefer Raft over Moyles at all, uh, but I, I thought uh, Raft was not bad. I should mention this was not Raft's first uh, try in the radio detective gig. Uh, he actually did star in a series. We played back, I think, season four uh, called Cases of Mr. Ace, right before we got into the Bob Bailey, Johnny Dollar serials. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback and uh, have a new iTunes review, or I should say Apple Podcast review. have to get used to that after all these years of just saying iTunes. Uh, this one by Joel. As a delivery driver, I spend a lot of time on the road. This podcast has provided many hours of entertainment and enjoyment uh, for me. Adam's commentary adds some interesting background to the various shows. I appreciate all his hard work to bring us these wonderful old-time programs. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your uh, comments, and uh, that will actually... Uh, do it for today. I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Nancy. Nancy has been one of our Patreon supporters since March of 2016, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Nancy. And join us back here tomorrow for Boston Blackie. Next uh, Wednesday, another episode of Rocky Jordan. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>